Welcome to SVG TV News for Tuesday, May 28th, 2024. I am Jennifer Richardson with the details. People displaced by natural disasters and those relocated by the government for various reasons will receive full ownership of their properties. This announcement was made by Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez during a news conference on Monday. All houses which we have built um, because of natural disasters. And we rebuild them, we give in people them. So that before what we were what we are saying that I want if it's a one bedroom at a one thousand dollars, a two bedroom at two thousand dollars, a three bedroom at three thousand dollars. We did a reassessment. That's why all the houses which you see we build up in in um up in NDB. Not with more than we build in down in North Leeward. Orange Hill. Orange Hill, people can get them free. We need them. Just making sure that. Um, similarly, those, those, those which we build by Hollywood, down in, um, in North Leeward, because of, of damage there, those with people who move carry them to Manage Village are giving all of them the deal without one cent. In addition to residents of North Leeward and North Windward, those in the Lomans housing scheme and other government relocated areas are also entitled to house deeds. However, there will be an agreement that the houses cannot be sold for seven years. But what you will do, you will put a covenant saying you can't sell it within a seven year period. If you want to sell it, you just have to hold on until after the seven years, yeah? Because you can't make somebody go and sell it, take the money, go here and come back and tell you they want a house again. President of the Public Service Union, Elroy Boucher, is refuting accusations made by acting Prime Minister Montgomery Daniel, who claimed that on May 16th, Boucher stormed the government printry and disrupted work. At a news conference today, Boucher stated that they did not breach any laws. Noting that workers demanded a meeting as they had not had one in about seven years due to the lack of approval to hold meetings with members at the printery. He said to avoid resorting to industrial action, they decided to hold the meeting. The cabinet secretary continued to deny the workers the opportunity to have the issues being heard at the workplace. In 2024, the workers got fed up with it, and they insisted that we come to the printry, just turn up to the printry and have the meeting. Now, this is termed as a form of industrial action. The other option that we had is that we could have withdrawn the workers from the job, call a strike, but we decided that's not the way to go because a meeting is only going to take like an hour, hour and a half. And there's no need to have the workers withdraw their services for any extended length of time. We proceeded at the request of the workers to inform the government printer, inform, not request, inform the government printer that we will be having, that is the union will be having a meeting with the workers at the printry at 1.30 on that Thursday. Boucher emphasized that SVG has signed on to the International Labour Organization conventions. And with that in mind, he said the government is breaching workers' basic rights to meet with their union to have their concerns addressed. First Vice President of the PSU, Gwyneth Stoddard, said on May 16th, she arrived with the executive team of the PSU at the printery ahead of President Boucher and related what transpired. And uh, I went inside to speak to one of the ladies. And Ansu, who is the admin rep, he said, he pat me on the shoulder and he said, this is started, we need to go upstairs to talk to the person in charge. So we went upstairs and he said, you all were supposed to come at 12.30, and it's after one, and we were only given, allowing you all to come and meet with the staff for the lunch hour. 
So I said, but we were at NIS, we could make it before that. We were dealing with some important issues. He said, well, we can't do anything to that. So I immediately, I asked, so what about if we go outside of the building? He said, no, that is taking away the people's time as well. So I called my sister here and I told, because she was with vouchers, I told her what happened and she said she will get back to me, but she did not. So the young worker had a conversation with the gentleman, Mr. Comijon, and she came and said, started, she said, he said we could only have five minutes. I said, what can five minutes do? So we went back downstairs and I started having a conversation with the people. And the young lady said, started, I'm timing you five minutes. So I said, I told them what, why we were late. And well, actually late for the 12.30, as the man said, we should have been there for 12.30. But in truth and in fact, the meeting should have been at 1.30. The PSU executive says they were made aware that the police were called in. However, for the duration of their meeting, no police showed up at the printery. Meanwhile, Boucher mentioned that prior to 2017, the PSU and the printery had a good relationship as meetings were held with workers. However, since the new cabinet secretary was installed, all correspondence to the printery goes to the cabinet secretary and they have been unable to get approval for meetings with workers. I have been requesting permission to meet with the printery staff as far back as 2017. And each time we are being told that permission was denied. And these meetings, these requests were made to have meetings at the workplace. And again, each time we are being told permission is denied. This type of behavior only started with the current cabinet secretary, Scotty and Barnwell. Previous to that, we never had a problem meeting the workers at the printry. All of the previous cabinet secretaries did not choose to micromanage the printry. The manager of the printry, we would normally write the government printer who would allow the meeting to be held either during a staff meeting or sometime at three o'clock, you know, within an hour, hour and a half. So when the CAPSEC, when Ms. Barnard became the CAPSEC, everything changed. And what we discovered is that when we write the government printer, the government printer refer us to the cabinet secretary stating that they do not have the authority to make such a decision. Boucher said he is satisfied that they were able to meet with workers as issues such as pension reform and other work-related concerns were heard. The workers' issues have since been sent to the cabinet secretary in a letter for redress. Three years after Ma suspended teacher Adriana King was charged with obstructing Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez from entering Parliament, during which time he received head injuries on August 5, 2021, the case has been dismissed. The court hearing took place today in front of Magistrate John Bala at the Calico Magistrate's Court. After the matter was dismissed, King, in an interview with CIBS News, related the amendments that were made, which prolonged the court hearing when such a matter should have concluded within six months. This matter started in 2021. I was initially accused of blocking Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez from entering Parliament. Then it was amended to attempting or attempted sorry to blocking him and then the other amendment was that i did something more or less as a precursor to attempting to block him and the lone witness in that matter was trevor buju bailey who is now assistant commissioner of police who according to him um his witness statement said that he saw me at the main gate and I held up my hands and I called the crowd and I tell them, Ralph Nagwain in the today, something of that sort. Um, so from since 2021 to today, I've been coming to court. There are times when, like today, where the assistant commissioner isn't present, wasn't present. And there were also delays on my side, but primarily the delays were on the prosecution's side. 
King expressed mixed emotions after her court matter was discontinued. This matter ensured that I was interdicted and placed on half pay up until, well, whenever the Service Commission decides to review this case. Um, you asked to see how I feel. I should be elated, but there's another matter that is pending, and I honestly can't say that I feel any great sense of relief. I am grateful, yes, to have this matter off my back, but somehow I don't feel as though, you know, it is actually lifted. I honestly don't feel that way. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but it's, I'm trying, you know, to get that joy out because this one is gone, but I know the way this government operates. And so I'm always thinking, what next? After the charges were laid against King, she stopped receiving a full salary. And according to her, she has struggled to make ends meet. Being this with you and that helps a lot. So those are the things that really have kept me going thus far. The bills are piling up. I'll be honest, just this morning, Singer called me. <laughs> and I have to say this to the young man, well, when I have the money, I will come. Because of these matters, you know, I have been challenged for the custody of my daughter. So that's another matter that I'm facing along with all of these in the family court. And, you know, there are times when you just have to let go. You know, you, you just sit down and you have yourself a good cry. And then you shake it off and you get up and you say, you know what? There's still a sky above us. There's still a sun. And so as with the sun, the sun will come out tomorrow. So you get up and you just you go. Leader of the Opposition and President of the New Democratic Party, the NDP, Dr. Godwin Friday, last Thursday, May 23rd, 2024, held a meeting with the Supervisor of Elections, Dora James, at his office. A news release from the NDP says also present at the meeting were Vice President Major Sinclair Leacock, Chairman Daniel Cummings and Secretary General Brenton Smith. The party says the meeting was requested by the Supervisor of Elections to give an update on the plans of the Electoral Office to expunge the voters' list and to solicit the cooperation of the NDP in the process. The release says Dr. Friday noted that the Electoral Office must ensure that there is integrity during the removal of names from the voters' list and that no voter should be disenfranchised. It says questions were also raised about the composition of the voters' list, the registration process, and the procedure that is used to remove the names of the deceased from the voters' list. He further states that the supervisor of elections committed to doing all in her power to produce an accurate voters' list and to continue in the dialogue with the NDP. Patches of moisture laden low-level clouds will continue to move across St. Vincent and the Grenadines, resulting in a few occasional showers today, Tuesday. This is according to the 72 hours weather outlook issued by the SVG Meteorological Service, which says the mid-levels are expected to become dry on Wednesday, with sinking air aloft resulting in drier conditions. By Thursday, the Met Service says instability associated with a tropical wave should be affecting the islands, mainly over the Grenadines at first, gradually building to the mainland by evening. Scattered showers are forecast as the middle levels become moist. It says instability can last into the night before the atmosphere dries out on Friday. In addition, moderate Saharan dust haze is forecast from Thursday, reducing air quality and visibility. Easterly trades are forecast at 15 km per hour to 30 km per hour, becoming east-southeast on Friday with higher gusts. Seas are slight to moderate in open waters with swells ranging between 1 to 2 meters. Due to occasional wind gusts, the surface of the water can become agitated, producing white caps. St. Vincent and the Grenadines has lost a nation builder. Founder and leader of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Green Party, Ivan O'Neill, passed away at his home in Harmony Hall yesterday after a period of illness. O'Neill contested the 2005 and the 2020 general elections as the SVG Green Party East St. George candidate. However, he failed in his bid to be elected. Politician and lawyer Luke Brown is one of many people who have expressed condolences to O'Neill's family, friends and supporters. Brown says O'Neill will be remembered for being a stalwart in his own right. 
will cherish our memories of him. One thing that we could say for sure is that when Ivan O'Neill believed in a cause, he would stand up for that cause, and he would stand up even if it means that he uh, goes down in the annals of our national and political history as the Iron Man and uh, as the, the leader of his party, the Green Party, you know that the the, the Green Party was a marginal political party on the local landscape, but it played a role. And uh, many Vincentians have memories in one way or the other from the Green Party. Uh, in this, in, I mean, in fact, he has become so entrenched among us that when people are making a joke about how hot it is, they would typically resort to one of his proposals to... Uh, Put an air conditioning unit for the entire Kingston city. Um, but he, that was just a, a light hearted reference. Brown says O'Neill made his contributions to SVG and he will be missed. But the reality is that he, he did some, some good national service and he will be remembered for that. Uh, and uh, one of the things that he, he offered as his service was the insurance, he, that is that he ensured that there was a column, uh, SVG Green Party column in the local newspapers ever so often, and he, uh, from time to time, presented views in those columns, which I, I think were uh, the readers found to be worthy and worthwhile, and which could perhaps or may have perhaps influenced uh, political policy and practice in St. Vincent and Grenadines in one way or the other. We will remember him and we will miss him. Uh, may he rest in peace. Political commentator and lawyer Jomo Thomas says he is saddened by the passing of Ivan O'Neill, whom he describes as a visionary who wanted the best for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Thomas said while many fail to recognize O'Neill's contributions, he will go down in history as a true patriot of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mr. O'Neill's contribution to St. Vincent in some quarters was um, mocked. His efforts were not seen, were not recognized. But I think when the f true history of St. Vincent is written, Mr. O'Neill would be remembered and mentioned properly. He would take his rightful place. He was never able to build a strong, broad movement of Vincentians. He's um, chaining himself to the Iron Man, um, standing up for the rights of people, small people. He is his, his almost disdain for the ways in which the Grenadines were sold out by both the ULP, well, the NDP before him, and the ULP government and the way in which we have this very valuable and prized piece of real estate and literally give it away to millionaires and billionaires, not getting the just rewards from taxes and so on. In fact, we give away more in tax concessions than we collect taxes. O'Neill was an advocate for the environment, which Thomas said is one of the many things that he will be remembered for. Thomas said O'Neill understood the long-term impacts of climate change, which SVG and other countries are currently experiencing. But the fact that he formed the Green Party said that his mind and his instincts were in the right place. You understand the Greens across the world, they are very much concerned with environmental issues. And Mr. O'Neill was very, very concerned about environmental issues. He was concerned about the blue economy and the ways in which he thought we were being exploited by foreign powers as it relates to our seascape and the fisheries that traverse our waters. He always talked about making St. Vincent cool as um, for citizens, as the police, year after year, we got record um, upon record of a heated climate and atmosphere. He was very, very patriotic, and he tried to demonstrate that in multiple ways. So on the round, I think Mr. O'Neill is an 
important personality and post independence in tension and may you transition well in a time when the demands placed on members of the Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force are growing, maintaining physical health is not a choice. It is a requirement in order to carry out their duties. On the Police on the Beach program on NBC Radio, Lieutenant Cam Cameron Beach of the SVG Coast Guard Services noted that there is a noticeable increase in young people who are not physically fit and who fall prey to non-communicable diseases. Early in the careers, early in my career is more important because that's when, you know, I had more of an active role you're going to see and stuff like that. Um, but right now, you know, like your officer, so kind of like being a desk, but early in the career when you had to go to sea and stuff like that, you had to be able to, you know, jump on and off boats, jump on and off a jetty. If you, anybody, any of you have ever been out to the Coast Guard, you know what, what's that like. Yes. I know some of you from the rubber response unit have been out to see with the Coast Guard, so you know how physically demanded it is. Yes. Um, but you see now a lot of young people, they're not physically fit. A um, lot of issues they struggle with early, that uh, some of them are lifestyle diseases. Um, yes. But earlier in life, it was really important, and it still is. Um, but mainly, you know, it's like I told you, like mainly I cannot do it for my mental health. In terms of, I go to the gym now to just release some stress and um, my a long day. Just throwing some weight around and hitting the heavy bag feels good to me. So, yes, so that's my um, input into that. The installation of a gym facility in Kingston for all ranks of the RSVG police force is being advocated for by Sergeant of Police Nigel John, who is attached to the Rapid Response Unit. John said they cannot discuss law enforcement officers' fitness if they do not have the necessary equipment. We cannot talk about the fitness of police and we are not making it mandated that they must have a physical being, uh, be at a certain level of fitness. What I would advise is that we have a gym for police, Cadets, Police Youth Club, Auxiliaries in Kingston, in the heart of Kingston. Because mind you, the canteen is in the heart of Kingston and it, it's always full. Mm -hmm. If it was that kit, it would have been full. To so put the gym in, Kings, in um, Kingston too. What we can do, make it mandated. Every division, twice per month, they meet at a playing field at whoever who available meet at a playing field in that division and they have the physical day. It's a disciplinary organization, so they, they must show. Right. So there's no excuse for not being fit. And the senior branch, the head of the organization should take that up and then serve and make these things available and then make fitness mandated. Meanwhile, Sergeant John said that becoming physically active makes individuals more aware of their surroundings, particularly their bodies. He went on to list various advantages of physical fitness for law enforcement officers. Even you got to take a drink of alcohol, you, you think about your body, think about going to gym and how you compromise your body. Right. It, move you it make you more so well you're more sober mm -hmm. you sleep better you are prone to injury and if you, it happened that you are injured you recover quickly yes and not bashing anybody lifestyle everybody i think should live how they want to live but at the same time when a police officer open himself to be drinking drinking drink they open themselves to a lot of negative including corruption because people will see you as being drunk or accepting this and that and before you know it you're accepting some kind of thing that is not upright with it, with your occupation or, or the organization so, yeah so true. the transformation is good everything become better if you reduce stress prevent chronic disease, it's better in the gym. Mm -hmm. 
the transformation is much better. The Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force, the RSVGPF, is reminding the public that the National Firearms Amnesty Initiative will conclude on Friday, May 31st, 2024. The National Firearms Amnesty Initiative, which began on March 1st, 2024, aims to reduce the proliferation of illegal firearms in, in the country. With only two days left, the RSVGPF is urging those in possession of illegal firearms to participate and help make St. Vincent and the Grenadines safer. Members of the public are reminded that illegal firearms and ammunition can be handed over at police stations or to designated community leaders without fear of prosecution. The RSVGPF says this is a unique opportunity to foster a more peaceful nation for everyone. To culminate the National Firearms Amnesty, the RSVGPF will host its community walkabout and town hall meeting in the Barley community on Thursday, May 30th, 2024. The walkabout is scheduled to commence at 4 p.m., followed by a town hall meeting in the square at 6 p.m. Commission of Police Acting, Enville Williams, other senior ranks of the RSVGPF and members of the community are expected to deliver remarks at the town hall meeting. The RSVGPF says there will also be an open forum affording residents of Barley and surrounding communities the opportunity to speak and share their perspectives. The RSVGPF says these community engagements have been highly successful, fostering stronger relationships and open communication between the RSVGPF and the communities it serves. Thursday's event in Barley promises to be memorable, featuring live musical entertainment provided by the RSVGPF Police Band.